I'll give a short anecdote on my activism in space and why it happens. So I'm a survivor of conversion therapy. Conversion therapy is where they try to forcibly change an LGBT person into a straight um, cisgender person. Cisgender meaning your um, sex and your gender are in alignment, um, aka a man acts like a male identified person um, should, or does, not should, does. Um, all that to say, I didn't always dress like this. I definitely did not have a red mohawk at K-State. Um, I don't think anyone would recognize me as I'm walking the hallways now. Um, but I, in my um, youth, came out to my parents um, simply think, or understanding that you like someone, I like someone, you happen to like a person of the opposite sex, I happen to like a person of the same sex. And I thought that that was normal because I was a missionary kid. I had lived in places where I was the only one who spoke English for hundreds of miles around. So it makes sense that, oh, we don't always fit and think in the same ways. Like, culturally, this is just different. I just must be different than my best friends. And my parents did not agree with that. Um, through religious conversations and through a lot of physical abuse, um, a, a therapist legally tried to force me to be straight. Um, now, the challenge is, is that that's still legal in 45 states. Um, there are a variety of movies and um, projects that we're working on trying to bring to light this issue, but it is highly likely that if you encounter an LGBT student, especially in Kansas, that they have gone through some form of conversion therapy. We believe one in three go through a form of conversion therapy, and let's explain that statistic. Not everyone is gonna to go to a therapist. Sometimes it's gonna be your pastor saying, we'll pray this away. Sometimes it's your father telling you to act like more like a man, or a daughter to act more like a girl. All these are forms of conversion therapy because they're telling you what you are is not correct, what I want you to be is. So if you think about it in that realm, it's not a very comfortable conversation, and some of you in this room are already like a little bit fidgety. I know, it's really, really bad. Um, but the great thing about it is that we're finally putting to light what is happening. Um, back when I was at K-State, if you Googled conversion therapy, you would get a list of people who were offering conversion therapy. The first things that would happen would be 1-800-SHOCK-YOUR-KIDS, basically. Um, and those were all legal. Thankfully now, we've completely changed the conversation. Um, with those five states, slow and steady, we are saying this isn't right to do to a child who doesn't have the ability to give consent for what you're trying to do. Now, I tend to believe that conversion therapy is bad regardless of what age you are, but the thing is that you're gonna be having students in your classrooms who never even had the choice. They didn't even have the choice to decide whether this was something that they wanted to understand and explore. Also, they may not have any idea where they're actually ending up. A lot of these conversations of questioning are just figuring out that culture tells me this is what my sexuality must be, and sometimes that's a little bit more fluid. Um, that was a rambling point, but I hope that that gets you a little bit of context as to where we're going. Um, I think what I want to wrap up the anecdotal space is <coughs> empowering a person to be who they are gives them a better chance of success. My K-State years were good. They were really good. And there are people in this room who helped me get through them. But let's be very clear. The stress of worrying about whether I was going to get beat up walking across campus, the pressure of never seeing any professor like you ever, um, gave me this sense of, OK, well, just survive. Well, survival is not thriving. And that's <coughs> why each of you are so critical, is that you can give a chance for a student to thrive rather than just get through school. So I hope that gives us a little bit of context. I am an open book. Um, people joke a lot with me that um, it's hard for me to not answer a question. I was in USA Today featured for my energy research on Sunday, and on Wednesday I was in our LGBT um, newspaper there in DC talking about kink education, like within the same week, and my boss was very, very nervous. Um, so I get that that is something that is not always comfortable for everyone, but I want you to know that today I'm here because I'm really passionate about making K-State a better place. Um, I want this community to go out and it to not be KU where you go, 
to get a liberal education that will help other LGBT students. I want it to be K-State. I want this to be the place where every child can go and say, oh, <coughs> it's okay to be me, and the teachers who are going out and teaching those children to say, it's okay to be you. So hopefully that was helpful as a short beginning, and uh, let's have some conversation. <sighs> who wants to go first? Oh, no, 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 didn't see that, we're not, we're good. Seriously. I teach in here and it happens to be okay. We <laughs> just kind of go with it. Yeah. So we'll open the floor up for questions. Do any of you have some questions? Yeah, um, I look at career services and awesome. how do you allow for college engineering? Great. And so what advice do you have for students who do want to be themselves when developing their career? The absolute critical role is um, you have to believe in what you are presenting. You <coughs> must not be trying to do something that you are not. Um, which is why it's so hard for LGBT students is because for so many of us, we're trying to act like what we're seeing in the classroom, and that's not fitting. It doesn't necessarily mean that your gender presentation has to be different. It's just that when everyone else is around talking around the water, um, uh, whatever, green, get water, I don't, um, <laughs> God, this is going to be a really long day. Uh, um, drinking fountain. Drinking fountain. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Got this. You haven't left the room yet, so as of yet, I'm not going to drink it. Um, if, when you're sitting around the drinking fountain, when everyone else has to talk about their weekend plans with their wife, and you don't um, get to talk about your relationship at all, that makes you a less productive person. But what I mentioned to people is that you cannot have a bright red mohawk and heels in DC unless you are a thousand percent behind it as this is who I truly am. If I was in any way, shape, or form acting or trying to be this, it would fall flat on my face. So what I tell people is, don't try to be whatever you're seeing. Try to be who you are, right? Like I mean, I'm, that's a really simple thing that we all tell ourselves. But the whole point is that we're also told, sorry, if you're working in DC, you're going to wear a black suit, which is ironic that I'm wearing black. But okay, like you're going to wear a black suit. You're going to have a very specific haircut. You're going to have you know the nice Oxford shoes. That's what you're going to look like, and it's true, right? I walk through the halls, and it is person after person after person after person who are all generally white, um, and all generally doing the same exact thing, where I don't necessarily fit that, but that's okay. I'll stand out, but I'll also stand out for my academic prowess, right? I'm not, I have to back up what I'm, what I'm bringing to the table. Um, so I hope those are, those are the two points that I would generally say about career advice is one, critical that you do not try to be something you are not. It will, it will every single time, it has failed miserably. Every single time I have tried to walk into Anecdote. I am terrified about my lecture in College of Engineering today in Yale. I am terrified. Why? Because I, every single day at K-State, I would change clothes between the College of Music, excuse me, the Department of Music, and College of Engineering, because I was so nervous of what was going to happen in that college. And I would change clothes as I was walking across campus, because I was like, I've got to make sure that I am safe. That's what matters most. And that was so hard to walk into college engineering. Today I get to walk in as Sam, and that is gonna be an amazing moment. But it wouldn't be possible if this wasn't me, because I would still be nervous. I would still be thinking, oh, what if I'm not ready to be here? They invited me to give a lecture on advanced nuclear policy. Like this is, I've made it, I'm done, I'm good, we got this space. So that's, that's the first phase. And the second one, like I said, is be able to bring it, bring it up um, with foundational work, whether that's research, whether that's um, performance, whatever your skill is, has to be able to back up what you're saying. Right? I, if I was walking through Congress and the only thing important about me was the Mohawk, I wouldn't last. But I know what's going on and I do a lot of, of really good research and that helps me become valuable so that a senator can't get rid of me. A senator can't just say, well, he looks a little bit different. Nope, like you're invaluable. Be, make yourself invaluable in that space. Um, I hope that was helpful a little bit. We also uh, just, I can kind of announce, don't tell anyone because I'm going to announce it at the later lectures, but uh, we just set up the first LGBT engineering scholarship this morning. Um, so we're finally going to be able to do an LGBT engineering scholarship. So hopefully that will create more spaces where people get to ha go into a career because they had the scholarship money knowing that they were allowed to be themselves. I hope that's the Thing. That's what we said, cool. That's what I wrote as the goal. Right? So, <laughs> see what happens. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Um, so, can you talk about 
Absolutely. First off, um, high school, <coughs> the words, so at least here at K-State, words, the words LGBT actually were said, right? That was a big moment. Um, I was here with Andrea when we founded the LGBT Center here. Um, that was a big space that we at least had a, a focal point, okay? High school, the word was not even said. Now, in my, I didn't go in back into a lot of my conversion therapy experiences, but one of the things they told me was that all gay people had been murdered um, as children, that the government came through and killed them all, <laughs> Um, because they had brought AIDS into, the Ameri into America. Now again, this is conversion therapy, this is very radical, um, horrible brainwashing, but the, I believed it, of course, because that's one of the experiences I was having, and high school kept it going, because I never heard the words that were going on. There's a two part to your question. The first is being open when a person comes out to you. The second is creating an environment that they never even have to. That there's actually so much in that room that says, you can come out to me and I will be the safe space, but you also should know that there are others like you sitting right next to you. That is what I see a lot of the really importance of teaching is, is I had no teachers in high school that I was able to come out to. Laura, um, I'm not gonna cry. Laura from the McNair program who, uh, was the first person that I came out to here at K-State and who would later tell me that I was okay, I, I should really go for this graduate school thing, to which I am indebtedly grateful. Um, uh, yeah, right? Um, Laura did exactly what I think most people should do. It's Kansas. Now, Laura doesn't disagree with me, so that's not the perfect example, but Laura, Laura sat there, watched me cry, watched me go like, crazy, and then sat there and said, it's gonna be okay. Um, walked with me around campus um, to help me calm down, gave me a space that said, I understand that just like every other student on this campus, you're going to have challenges. Your challenge is a little bit different and a little bit unique in this space, but we're going to get you through that. That is what I think a person has to do. Laura does not come from a background with a lot of LGBT people. Laura doesn't have a lot of this space of like, oh yeah, I know I all the terms, I've got everything ready. Like, th these aren't things that necessarily Laura had, but Laura had a heart that was open to learning and helping a student succeed. Um, we chose graduate schools based on LGBT acceptance because this was now a thing um, that like, I, needed to, I needed to actually take into consideration. I apologize, but I only applied to the coast. It was MIT or Berkeley. Like, it was literally as far from the Midwest as possible. But that's okay, because it gave me a chance to come back as a person who was developed and strong in what I knew I was. Um, so your question, I'm kind of rambling away from, but starts with open, open dialogue regardless of what my perspective is. I, I, anecdotally, not as a teacher, but as a person who works with politicians, am constantly in the room with people who have said that I am debaucherous, that I am like, like all of these terrible things because they're speaking about a community in general terms, right? They've said that I am the end of America and then I get to come in and save them from North Korea. That's my job. Like my job is literally to come in and help them not end America. Um, <laughs> which is ironic. Um, uh, but that means that I have to walk into those rooms saying, okay, regardless of what you have said in the past, I want you to be successful. So I hope that's, that's exactly, actually that's exactly where we're gonna end it, is that you walk into that room every day wanting each of the students to be successful, them not being able to be who they are immediately makes that an impossibility. I hope that was it, yeah. Yep, other question? Yes? Sorry to intrude on here, sorry to intrude on here. Um, I, I taught school for about seven years mm -hmm. in uh, Idaho, and taught most of the middle school, high schools, and uh, Something that we saw during our time was uh, the advent of people trying to create safe zones yeah. in the schools. <coughs> and I just want to kind of share my experience and just kind of get your thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, we, we had some uh, had some great friends, very well-meaning. They, they had a son that was gay, and uh, I, 
think that was part of their cause of, of creating safe zones in the schools. Yep. But the idea was principals trying to create areas where students feel safe would give out little placards and little signs that a teacher would put by the door saying, safe zone. Yeah. And everyone knew that that meant was, well, if you're being bullied, if you're gay, these different things, you're welcome to come here. But there was teachers who didn't want to put that up because the yep. assumption is I'm putting a stamp on this saying I approve of this. Right. So now you have this built in, mm -hmm. are you for or are you against based on the sign. So what can principals do to make that a better, better thing for their staff and for their faculty? Brilliant question, but again, welcome to five years of not being in Kansas. I forgot that exact mm -hmm. challenge. Um, whew, the liberal East Coast has destroyed me. Um, uh, <laughs> I would say, I'm going to start with two parts about it. One, safe zones are really only as amazing as the training that, pro that they are provided. A lot of people put up safe zone training specifically to work with lesbian and gay and bisexual students, but they say LGBT. Um, and for people like me to walk into your classroom is a very different experience than a person who just, ju not just, I apologize, that was a really inappropriate statement, for, another, for a person who might be gay. That is a very different training that you need to have conversations about, um, knowing that you're not going to be able to cover all the bases for both. But that was actually a big thing that um, when we started doing Safe Zone here, I got nervous about K-State because K-State would really push the LG and then the T was there, uh, but like we had to really pull it in. Gender non-conforming students, that's going to be a challenge. Okay, so I'll add that as a first anecdote. So it's only as good as the training. Second, what you're asking is allyship versus support. Um, I, on the panel that I was on yesterday in Minneapolis, um, we talked about the spectrum from violence and what some said to <coughs> accept for what I actually call is the spectrum from violence to support, with steps along the way being tolerance and acceptance. Many people in the LGBT community get very upset with me that they say we should not accept tolerance. I disagree with that fact because as a person who lived in Kansas, Tolerance means that you're not going to attack me. And in some days, that's all I need. I just need you to not attack who I am as a person. You don't have to support, you don't even have to accept. You just need to not throw darts my way for one day so that way I can I have another chance. Sometimes I think that's how we should have conversations about safe zone. We should have it recognizing that there's going to be a spectrum of people of, of, in safe zone who are some tolerant. I, will, I need to know what to not say to harm a student. I also need to have people who are going to be like, I want to shower love and adoration on this student who is being so brave in a, in a community that might never accept them again, right? <clears throat> I know that that's not really helping you with logistics, but that's what I, I, I think of when I think of Safe Zone is that we're teaching as if everyone is going to be, like, not carrying a pride flag, but like, really strongly supportive. That's not necessarily true. There weren't uh, sorry, engineering again, I love you, I really do. <laughs> like, there weren't barely any safe, I mean, Andrew and I would beg people to put up a safe zone anywhere in engineering, because even if you weren't going to be supportive, I needed to know that there was a room that I could run in to cry. Like, I needed that, and I was trapped in a building with zero support. So even someone saying, I'm not Sam, I, I, because of religious <coughs> beliefs, because of other things, I'm, I'm not able to support you entirely, but I want you to know that you're safe. That is, I, I, we've co-opted safe zones to be GSA light, um, Gay Straight Alliance light. It's not, it's, it's, it needs to be what it, it is in that it has different perspectives because also, sorry as I'm thinking through this question, safe zone trainings can also be a community conversation about, sorry, you're both safe zone members, you have different ideas of what that means, but that's the conversation you need to be having in training is, oh, okay, that's really good. So if I'm not able to support a student a thousand percent, be their champion, then I should send them to you. But I can still be a bridge that says, here's safe passage to someone that I know will help you. I don't know if that was a helpful answer to your question, but I think that's how I would say it. I've never been asked that question. That's a really interesting. Thank you for that conversation. It's really beautiful. Other questions? Yes. Politics 101. Um, first off, 
marriage was a huge moment for the concept that people across the country now see that a certain segment of a population is given equal status in one area of life. That seems really political. But what that actually means is just, okay, I can't discount an entire population because they in some way are the same as me. They at least have something in common with my perspective. For many of us, marriage is literally the like sliver at the top of a very large cake um, that, that needs to be baked. Um, so great, congratulations, really, really important, really important, we can now be married. And that is really big, again, especially in Kansas as well, where you're gonna have a little bit more hard time with the LGBT political needle, it gives protection. If what I talked about is a bridge, marriage is a great bridge. It, it gives you financial protection to get to further spaces. What we immediately watched happen afterwards, though, was the needle flying the other direction um, <coughs> locally. State politics flipped entirely where, okay, you can be married, but we're going to remove any protections you had um, for business. We are going to remove any of your anti-LGBT bullying laws. Um, it's just been really, really rough. I have seen my area, conversion therapy, is on the definition of a Mount Everest climb. Um, conversion therapy is the erasure of the LGBT community one child at a time. I'm sorry, but that's what you need to you need to think of it that way because it is literally trying to remove the existence of a population. In any other community, we would see that as horrifying. But in the United States, we can have a presidential candidate whose husband practices conversion therapy. Michelle Bachman. I am not saying that that you should or should not vote for Michelle Bachman. Again, I work very equally with both parties. I am saying you should not be voting for someone whose husband practices the erasure of an entire population. That, that is how I um, currently go about that space. Um, religious liberty laws are really, really important on that needle. As a queer person of faith, it is critical to me that we stop putting religion and LGBT as two opposing forces. Um, one, it highly damages those of us who live in both. Um, we are the minority of the minority. Um, and it creates an absolutely false dichotomy regardless of how you see faith perspectives, your faith perspective of an LGBT community member, it is highly likely that your religious practice has a God that values love. So being known as an organization that is blatantly trying to attack the protections of a community does not seem like love. Now, I'm not saying that the necessarily, and I'm trying to really be balanced here, I'm not saying that as a pastor you have to go out and be supportive of an LGBT protection bill. But I was here when we first passed the, the LGBT protections here in uh, Manhattan, and I was at every hearing trying desperately to get my students and to get my community members all coordinated that we can do this, we can do this. And then pastor after pastor after pastor would come up and say, these people do not deserve any special rights and I would respond to these pastors going to their services every Sunday. I would go into their rooms and say, I'm not asking for, I'm not asking for special rights. I'm asking to be treated as just as much as you are treated. Nothing else. That is a conversation that we need to be having as a community, is that the needle needs to not be dependent on someone's interpretation of a God. That is what I'm asking um, people to do. You do not have to be supportive. I, I will never, as a missionary child, I learned the beauty of someone finding out a religious experience, finding a faith, or or learning a new perspective that they hadn't before. That is a really beautiful <coughs> moment to me. I, um, I preach. I love the ability to share how God has worked in my life. I also have to recognize that that is not for everyone. My, my perspective should not have a domineering effect on the lives and abilities of others to live their lives. I hope that kind of answers that question. The only last part I'll say is I'm very, very, very annoyed that nationally, in national politics, we have created a dichotomy where Republicans are anti-LGBT and Democrats are pro-LGBT because that only exacerbates a problem because now it has become a social litmus test. There are people, again, I have worked with many of these candidates in their, in their congressional careers. There are people who who will hug me as I walk into their office in heels 
but then on national on national television, half must crucify me, or ooh, that was an ironic term, um, uh, <laughs> because they would lose votes otherwise. That is a big problem, and I think one of the reasons. Thank you. Um, one of the big reasons that I, I mentioned um, conversion therapy has power is that it was the first bill, California. <coughs> Second bill was New Jersey. Governor Chris Christie signed a bill ending conversion therapy. So this is not a bipartisan. This is sorry, this is a bipartisan issue. Issue, and it gave us a sliver of it's okay to protect children, regardless of who they love. It's okay to protect children. Um, so I hope that that is something that we can kind of start bringing in. I am very tired of, of my friends in either side attacking the other for their LGBT stances because they're not recognizing that this is blatantly money and power equaling votes that I have to uh, have to lie by. So does that answer? Great question. Other questions? I think we have, yeah, we still have about 10, 15 minutes. Yes. Um, you talked about creating like a safe environment in a classroom for an LGBTQ student to be able to come out uh, and his or her teacher. Yeah. What, I guess, constitutes a safe environment? What makes someone feel safe in yeah. that sense? Great. Um, can I do an awesome teachable moment? Can I say their experience? You said yeah. his or her. Yeah, totally good. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so their experience. Safe spaces are where I believe that what I say has value. And how I act has value. <laughs> that is a really <laughs> bipartisan thing to say. But I learned that it's not about a flag on the door. It's not about... Um, the training you're going to get, because every student is so unique that there is no way that any training is going to cover what that coming out, that first child coming out to you is like. There's no way. Um, you're going to be a deer in the headlights, headlights, and that's okay, because guess what? They're the deer. At this point, they're like, where in the world am I going? Like, what is, what is happening? They probably have almost no chance to learn about what their experience is going to possibly be like. They're also freshly um, able to accept new information. The great part about students is that one, we should be students all of our lives, that students are waiting for your reaction to know how others are going to react. They are literally using you as a litmus test. What we asked before, was a social litmus test? They're using you. What you say and how you act will be like, oh, okay, if this is data point, right? Professor one said this, so professor two, three, and four are all gonna say the same thing. Even that, that's not even all true. So safe spaces are saying, if you don't know the words to say, that's okay. If you don't know what action to give, that's okay. What you are trying to do is make sure that that student realizes that whatever they are saying has value. You're gonna have students, and I try to point this out as well, you're gonna have students that come out to you as anti-LGBT. You have to start remembering, we have to stop thinking that every student is going to, like every coming out experience is going to be someone saying that they're gay. Sometimes it's going to be a, I heard Billy's gay and I really hate that. Well, you now have a second coming out experience that you again have to have a very, I want to value what you're seeing. Because I recognize that where you thinking that Billy is bad because Billy is LGBT comes from a cultural context that you cannot break. That, 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 that came from somewhere. You didn't all of a sudden be like, that ah, LGBT people, I hate them, okay. Uh, I'm like, that wasn't, that wasn't your line. So, saying, okay, why do you think that Billy being LGBT is bad? Again, the empowerment questions are always really, really good. Um, you're not giving value to what they're, you're not giving support. Remember, we don't talk about this whole like, acceptance <laughs> levels. You're not giving support to what they say. Well, I'm hoping you don't give support to what they're saying but you're giving value that that voice deserves a space at the table. And that works in both ways. So that's how something I think that, especially in Kansas, is the most, is the highest degree of success. Is that it's, I'm not, I am not choosing sides on this war. Now if you want to be a champion, you're gonna have less people come out to you in the opposing direction, right? Because they don't, they'll not think that their opinion is valid. The reason that many of us don't come out to our teachers is because we don't think that that person has our best interest at heart. But, if you, and, so, and, and in reverse, right? So like if you created yourself as an LGBT champion in the, in the school, you're gonna have definitely students who are gonna come out to you. You're also, highly likely in the state and other uh, states, you're also gonna have students who won't come out to you because by coming to you, <coughs> outing by proxy. 
Um, so there was this really interesting space where I had professors, I had professors at K-State who were gay but wouldn't come out, and it was actually probably better because I could go and have conversations with them, and it wasn't outing. It was just me talking to a professor. I hope that kind of answers your question about safe spaces. Um, in that if it comes back to value and it comes back to not caring what words you say, I'm really, I'm really tired of every training trying to tell you exactly what to say. When the boy in heels comes up to you, you're not going to know what to say. I'm just going to say that like right now. Like, you're just not, and that's okay. It's, it's, we're teachers. We're people who want the world to experience things that they haven't experienced before. That's what I consider teaching, right? I don't consider it actually the road conversation of the facts. I consider it the opening a door to a new experience. Sometimes those experiences are awesome quantum physics. Sometimes those experiences <laughs> are a uh, choir. Sometimes those experiences are uh, hearing lots of math, you know, behind it. Like those are those are all spaces that all have value, and so you're just continuing that line. Does that help? Yeah. Good. Oh, I'm gonna, and I'll be your second. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I have a question about the idea of conversion therapy. If you could talk a little bit yeah. more about that. Is that something that is more, or that you see more common, commonly in like minors whose parents or guardians are, are forcing that upon them, mm -hmm. or, um, or, or could you talk, or maybe in college students who feel like they, that's their way of being more accepted? I mean, how, just think, talk a little bit more about that. Absolutely, um, and I don't know my schedule well enough, but I'm giving a lecture on conversion therapy tonight. I think at seven. Is that right? Anyway, uh, six thirty. Something. And at some point, so if you were interested in that, I they like told me what I, was, I just show up in different places now. Uh, uh, K State day. Uh, uh, we'll start with the teacher moment, which is there's no data. Um, why is there no data? Because this is almost always private, um, and when it's private. There is the concept of it's a very terrified. I'm going to give an end here. Right? It's a very terrified mother who is trying to save her child, who doesn't want anyone else to know that this child is LGBT. Like literally no one. Um, so of course the data is just completely gone. What we do have is we have the advertisements. So people still can again because this is legal in 45 states. You advertise your services, and so as people advertise, we know that they're going through this. We know that there's over 100 centers across the country that offer this um, still. It is blatantly higher than that number, obviously, right? You're not, most of these are going to be personal connections, so it's not going to be advertised. But let's say that 100, and each of them we know have at least 10 students going through them every year um, on average. That means that 1,000 children are going through this. Now, that number seems small, but if you're thinking about the ramifications of Again, the pastors and the parents and all of that space, it can get can be quite a bit. Um, it's also a huge industry. So again, one of the things that I'll say in the lecture tonight is that I'm actually not trying to attack the, the issue of conversion therapy because I can't. I, I can never stop a parent from telling a child to be straight. I literally have no power over that. But I can stop an industry from profiting off the pain of parents. That is something that I can do. We know that it used to be a majority were over 18. So when LGBT in LGBT history, it was originally not minors because you definitely were never out at eight. Like if you if you think about it, as students keep getting younger, that as LGBT as people keep coming out younger, we're gonna keep having conversion therapy go earlier. Um, they weren't coming out till their adult years, and then they would go. They wanted to stay with their wife. They wanted to figure out their life, and they would go into conversion therapy. Now it tends to be younger because if you can stop it early. Their, the rest of their lives um, will be easier. Um, we don't. I don't have again. I don't have good data on you for you. Um, I will say though, um, we have multiple centers here in Kansas. Um, when <coughs> I would, uh, the most painful night of my K State life was we did an event at the student union, and upstairs. A survivor of conversion therapy was talking about how it saved his life, and downstairs I was talking about how it ruined mine. And it was the same night. We were really good friends. He's actually um, a really good friend of mine, and it is excruciating to hear that he truly believed that this saved his life. Um, and I, you can see the pain. 
know, the amount of pain that he's going through. That's why I think conversion therapy matters, is that we have a large community of ex, well, they call themselves ex-A's, um, so if you hear that term, that's what I'm describing, um, that we need to be supportive of those students as well, because let's be very clear, the, the child going through your classroom may either be going through conversion therapy or may have gone through already. You have, there's no distinguishing mark, right? Like we, it is not <coughs> something that is outwardly um, visible, and so because of it, we have almost no way of finding and helping those students, most of which cannot go to mental health services because mental health services what, were what caused them so much pain. Um, the statistic that I can give you, um, and I apologize for um, those in the room who are talking about suicide, so if that's a trigger for you, um, please feel free to zone out um, for the next a little bit of time. I came back out K State um, and found a, a survivor community. Roughly six of us, 60 of us, excuse me, were connected social media wise. 11 of them are still alive. We have lost massive amounts of survivors to, to suicide, myself being extremely prone to it. I had three suicide attempts at K State because you can't go to health services. You literally cannot sit in an office on a couch opposite of someone because that is exactly what happened before. Um, so just that, I hope, gives a little bit of context around the area. Um, we definitely still recognize that it happens to adults and none of the bills that we are passing, legislation-wise, address over 18. Um, federally, we are working on something which I consider pure legal genius, um, which is, this is consumer fraud. So that would hit a person over 18 because you are lying to us, taking our money and telling us that you can change us when you cannot. So that is the only time that we're addressing that community. The problem is, is that, as you know with federal politics, that is very low chance of, of getting any traction um, under the current environment. But does that answer your it, question it, on a little bit of context? It does. Uh -huh. Thank Good. you. Absolutely. We've got about four minutes. Is there another question? I just have yes, a about yeah. safe space. Thank you. Um, particularly for, and I'm a former classroom teacher for the K-12, you know, and, and, and above, but um, you know, what you do in your classroom can help create that safe space. When we talk about social justice, we talk about um, disability, or just my background, we talk about racial diversity, we talk about sexuality. So any, anything that you can bring into your classroom, whether it's the books that you decide to read or the posters you put up on the wall, um, really can help create a safe space for all students. And the other thing I wanted to comment on is more and more same-sex couples are having children. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to have the Thank two you. moms that are going to come to the parent-teacher conference. Yes. And you're going to have the kid um, the fifth grader, when there's a father-daughter dance, you know, how are you going to handle that? Thank you. Really, I'll leave it to Andrew to always be brilliant. And then, uh, <laughs> got me through college. Um, so that is very wise. Um, you mentioned posters and, and reading. I also say it, it's literally just conversation. Just not figuring out how, I know it's going to be really difficult in some math classes to somehow in the world figure out how to bring in LGBT politics, but your word, people, I say this all the time, I tell them, your word problems. You assign word problems all the time that are blatantly gendered or blatantly have heterosexual couples in them. Why does <coughs> Bobby have to buy Sally a rose? Why can't Bobby buy Billy a rose, right? Like, and how much does that rose cost? You know, 10 miles now, great, whatever. Um, like, uh, <laughs> Done with classes, guys. Done. Um, <laughs> sorry. Girl, that's, girl, that was a terrible statement. Okay, anyway. Um, I, I hope that right, exactly. I hope that I hope that, that is a really good clarification as well. Is that how your, your conversation and how you speak about things is also going to be just as critical as the poster hanging on the wall. Because a lot of people will put up a poster and the room will still be silent. Make the room not silent. Um, yep. One of the things I talk about in my class is something as simple as when you're introducing your spouse mm -hmm. or you're having a conversation, using the term partner. This, yes. mm -hmm. um, this is my partner, Mario. We've yes. been married for 16 yes. years, you know. And at the beginning of the semester, even the looks I get initially, for some of my students, it's like, oh, I'm going to do you more. <laughs> That's their initial response. And then I also see other students, it's like, their, their shoulders drop, and it's like, okay, so this is how the semester's gonna go. Yeah. And they're much more open, and it's like it deflates the tension in the room. And I teach a diversity course, and that's 
really important. And I appreciated the questions and some of the statements that you made that made the connection between uh, aspects and conversations around diversity. We have to move past the fact that it's a black white thing yep. or an English or a non-English thing. It's not a language thing, it's not a race thing, that there are so many levels. Rural, urban, suburban, oh my God. Amen. The diversity that Amen. you see just based on the region. Um, your geography <coughs> is huge. Um, differences in genders is an aspect of the diversity. There are so many different facets of diversity and if we can be open and have conversations about that, regardless of where we come from, our background, our faith, our gender, our sexuality, just creating that space through conversations is so vital. Um, and Andrea had mentioned social justice is kind of a, um, a nice umbrella term that lots of people define in different ways. Um, but I, I, I really find that that term is powerful because that's why we all went into teaching is to make a difference, right? I mean, we were going into this profession, we're paying thousands of dollars and spending hours and hours and hours in classrooms to learn how to make a difference for kids. And in order to do that, you've got to use your voice to advocate for students. Because if you don't, in many cases, no one will. Um, and so, I, not a shameless plug, but um, we have just started a social justice research certificate that at the graduate level that I want to at least have in the back of your mind. I know most of you are undergraduate students, but there's always opportunities to grow and to learn. And while you're here in your core content, you may only get one class that creates a safe space for these kinds of conversations. Um, but all of us have continuing learning to do. So if you're thinking about a graduate program, this is a really nice um, way to, to open new doors for new conversations as you um, increase your knowledge and skills as a professional. So if we could give a round of applause. <laughs> If you haven't already, if you would please sign the sign-in sheet, we want to make sure to acknowledge that you are here. Thank you again for taking the time to come here today. I really appreciate it. Any last comments? Thank you all so much for being here. Have a great day. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And if you want to... Uh,